Revelation chapter number 21. Begin reading verse number 1. The Bible says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven, saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them, and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I will make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, It is done, I am Alpha and Omega, beginning and the end. And I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But the fearful and unbelieving, and the abominable, and murderers, and whoremongers, and sorcerers, and idolaters, and all liars, shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Now, if you'll remember the end of chapter number 20 last week was the great white throne of judgment where those that died without Christ had to give an account for their sin and then be condemned with their sentence which from the beginning was death and then they were cast into the lake of fire. We Again, I don't know how long between the events of chapter number 20 and chapter number 21 start but John said, and I saw a new heaven and earth. If you'll remember, when it said that God sat down on the great white throne of judgment, what happened? Heaven and earth fled away from his face. All creation fled away from his face. Nothing was worthy to stand before God except what? Christ. Right? Us being robed in Christ, we were the jury at the great white throne of judgment. But then... Those that were called before God, right? They got a glimpse of it during the great tribulation period. They've read, to, fled to the mountains and caves, crying that rocks would fall on them and hid themselves away from God because they couldn't stand at His face or stand to see His face, right? Well, all things were gone, and then John said, "And," but at another point, John looked up. What did he see? He saw a new heaven and a new earth. Right, something that God created fresh, new. What does God always intend for His people? The best. What gets in the way of God being able to give people His best? It's man's will. Man's will is what brought sin. Man's will is what keeps us from submitting to the will of God. Right, well, now all wills are in line with Him. Everybody that's left alive, they've got a glorified body. Right? God says we don't have to deal with the earth that was tainted with sin. Right? Even to double down. Heaven now is great, I guarantee you. But new heaven's going to be great. Is it going to be greater? I don't know. But it's going to be new. God said if we're starting over, might as well make a new heaven too. As I was reading this, I was thinking, what is heaven? Heaven is the abode of God. Well, if God once had an abode where man could not dwell because they were separated by sin, God makes a new heaven where everyone is welcome. Right? Where man can fellowship with God. It says that the tap, well, we'll get to that here in a second. Never mind. Hang on. Put that on the back burner. Okay? It says, New heaven and new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. The sea is always a picture of of separation. Okay, what separates this body of land from another body of land? The sea. Right? The sea is not only wide, it is deep. Okay, the deepest place on earth, you could submerge Mount Everest into it and there'd still be water on top of it. Right? It is deeper than the highest place on land. Okay, in the Old Testament, one of the illustrations that every year when Israel would make the sacrifice for sin, right, with that spotless lamb, 
One of the analogies that God said he would hide their sin, he'd put them behind his back, or where'd he put them? He'd hide them in the bottom of the sea to where he would not observe, he'd forget about them. Right? There is no more sea in new heaven and new earth. There's no more separation. There's no more place that God has to use as an illustration of where he puts all the imperfection than the things that he overlooks in his long suffering. No, there's nothing more to hide. Right? There's no more reason for separation. I believe, okay, if you were to study that map back there hanging on the wall, okay, that at one point when God made the first earth, I believe that it was all land and then wasn't separated by seas. Why do you say that, Brother Jordan? Well, because how else in the world could all of the things that were made have been scattered across the earth in all these different places? How could Adam have you know, gone back and forth and named all these things? But it said that God wanted to fellowship with man. If God's walking, I know God can walk on water. I know Adam had a glorified body like him. But God's creation, given to man, he was given charge over everything. Do you think God would have inconvenienced Adam by separating the things that he had to keep an eye on? But if you just go and look at that map and start putting things together and moving pieces around, it looks a whole lot like a puzzle. When did all that happen? During the flood in Noah's day. Right, if you study and take samples of dirt all around the world, you can't find dirt that just belongs in one spot. You'll find it somewhere else on the other side of the earth where the same dirt's found in a completely different location and then, according to science, they never should have touched. Right, how did that happen? That's what God did during the flood when he broke up the foundations of the earth and he remade the earth. But here, there's no more sea. Not only is there no separation between land, it's a symbol of the fact there's no more separation between God and man. Okay, well, then it says, verse number 2, I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. So you know when Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled, if you believe in God, believe also in me, I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. Where does New Jerusalem come from? doesn't come from what God created on earth. It's not something that just sprung up out of earth. Okay, like the Garden of Eden, God made his creation grow up. No, this is something that God prepared in heaven, sent down to earth. At that place that he said he was going to prepare a place for you, it's that city right there. Okay, we'll get into the details of that city in a little bit, like in the next couple of weeks. But it's a big city. And he said he was going to prepare it for you. He said he looked and he saw a city coming down. Okay, this is, if you will, okay, picture it as the crown, right? The final piece to make God's new earth complete. Okay, a king can wear all the fine clothes that he wants to. Okay, a uh, Nobility can get dressed up in all the finery and all the customary, but without that headpiece, the rest of it doesn't mean anything. Right? The point of new heaven and new earth is that God and man will no longer be separated. And to symbolize it, God sends down out of heaven a holy city that he prepared especially for those that love him. And in that city, each one of them have a prepared place just for them. And he sits down this new city called New Jerusalem. And it says, right, coming down out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Okay, again, there's that analogy like the church being the bride of Christ, being prepared for Christ to come back and get them during the rapture. Okay, here this city has been prepared for what? A day and a time and an hour. How many times, well, let me walk this back. If you do it right, okay, how many times are you supposed to be a bride or a groom? Okay, and then I understand people are widowed and people get remarried, but get the analogy. Okay, 
all the pomp and the circumstance of the wedding day. Right? That's intended to be a big occasion because it's supposed to be rare in your life. Okay, well, this city was prepared as a bride for... Uh, everything has been completed. Right? If you will, all the catering's been taken care of. We've already had the marriage supper of the Lamb. Okay, all of the things that would... You know, nowadays, the things that drive people nuts... Right, people canceling this or this changing or it's it might rain and we're going to have to move where we get the photos done, right? All of the unpleasantries about that day have already all the judgments have been taken care of. Okay, all of the things that cause pain or frustration or heartache that's all gone, and now it's time for what? It's time for everything to come together as it should have been. This only happens once. He sends New Jerusalem down once. And he says it's a crown. It's, it's prepared like a bride for her husband, for the groom. Right? All the effort and all the work that Christ has put in since the day that he went back to heaven to prepare a city for you, this is the day that you get to see how much the groom really does care about you. Okay, how much effort that God, not, having to, not needing to, not having to, but He chose to make this place for you. And as it descends out of heaven, the picture that I imagine we'll all get, the thought, the feeling, the sentiment, is appreciation, reverence, and worship towards God that He would even make something so beautiful for us. I will remind you, that it hasn't even entered into the heart of man what God's gone to prepare for them that love him. The glimpse that we get of this new city in these chapters, you can't even begin to wrap your head around how beautiful, how great, how lovely new heaven, new earth, and new Jerusalem are going to be. But, also another thing, God calls it new Jerusalem. Is it the old one? No. But what was Jerusalem? Jerusalem was the place where, in the Old Testament, that's where the temple, right, God's house, was located. A place that Israel set aside and said, this is where we dedicate, we, con we consecrate, we reserve a place that only God can go into. And every now and then He'll invite the high priest to come in once a year, but nobody goes in there except for God. That's God's space. Right? That happened in Jerusalem. Where did the king, right, during the millennial reign, where did Jesus sit on his throne? In Jerusalem, the city of David, upon the throne of David. New Jerusalem is a reminder that he's still in control. Right? We may have bodies like his. We may have minds like His. We may look in every point like Christ, but we're still not the Lamb. Right? And His city is the what? Set up a reminder of His rule. He's still in control. Right? New heaven, that's the throne of God where God abides. New earth, that's where formerly man would reside. But God sets up a city. There wasn't a city the first time around where He made everything. Right? Man didn't have to consecrate a place for God. God says, this is my place among my people. It shows His ownership not just of the throne, but also of the people upon the earth. And it says, verse number 3, I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and He will dwell with them, and they shall be His people, and God Himself shall be with them and be their God. Okay, He still is God today, tomorrow, for all of eternity. I don't know if we will make supplications in eternity future. We'll have need of nothing. There will be no more want of anything. But I guarantee you there's still going to be prayer. Why? Wow, that's just talking to God. You don't think you're going to talk to Jesus for all of eternity? 
Right? You don't pray to somebody that you're equal. You pray to the Almighty. You don't offer up thanks to those that didn't do anything for you. Well, everything from that day forward, right, really, if we were to be honest, everything from the day that you took your first breath forward, and if you really want to be honest, even things that happened before you were alive that God arranged people to get you to a place to where you could hear the gospel in your lifetime, right, it's all by the hand of God. I'm sure that, because the Bible does say we'll be known as we were known, at some point we know that through fellowship in heaven we're going to run into people that maybe we were an instrument that God used to get the gospel to them, but we're not going to be thanking each other. We're going to say, I'm thankful that Jesus chose to send somebody like you by my way. You're not thankful for me because all I am is what he made me. You're not going to be thankful for the person that told you about it. You may thank them for lending themselves to Christ to be used as a tool, but you can't thank them. You're going to worship God and praise God together for what God did. I just thought. But it says, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with them. A tabernacle, right, was a temporary building before the temple. But the tabernacle is what Israel carried in the wilderness to move around the house of God, the holy of holies, right, where the Ark of the Covenant was kept. And then the outer court around that. It's where Israel would camp. And if you study out the formation, they actually camped from an aerial view in the shape of a cross. Right? Everywhere the tabernacle went, that's where God's people went. He's going to have a city that's a symbol of his rulership here on earth. He's going to have a place for each one of us. But you want to know where we're all going to be at? Wherever God moves. It doesn't say that that city's stationary. God could move it and just be like, hey, y'all want to see what I made over here? And then it just moves to a different part of the new earth. But could you imagine? Right, Brother Bob? if Jesus sat you down and told you why he made new earth the way that he made it and how he made it and everything else and then it all boils back to the fact that he loves you and that's why he made it that way I don't know that that's going to happen but he's God he can do whatever he wants to but he didn't say that the temple of God is with man he says the tabernacle of God tabernacle is mobile temple is stationary but notice what he says even though the tabernacle is mobile, it says he will dwell with them. Stop. Right? No, at some point he'll dwell with them. No. It says, and he will dwell with them. Continual, continual tense. Future tense. Everywhere he is, that's where we'll be at. He's not coming to visit. No, he's staying. Right? We dwell with him. It says, and he will and they shall be his people. And God himself shall be with them. Not like in the Old Testament, where there was a pillar of fire or a pillar of cloud. Okay, not like a burning bush, where the angel of the Lord came down into a bush and spoke to Moses out of it. No, we're going to get to see him as he is. It'll be God himself that dwells with us. Not the Holy Ghost, although I'm sure the Holy Ghost is still going to be around. Okay, but God Himself in the flesh, in real time, in real space, will dwell with His people forevermore. It says, verse number 4, And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. There shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain. For the former things are passed away. Every time I read the tail end of that verse, I also think of salvation. He said that if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. For old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. Well, here we've already heard about how he's made all things new. And he's reminding us that the former things are passed away. 
Why did God raise you in newness of life? Because He intended you to receive this new world, new heaven, new earth, new Jerusalem. And He knew that the old things had to die in order for you to live here in life. When you received life, it wasn't because God needed you to be in heaven. It's because God wanted you to be in new heaven, new earth, and new Jerusalem. And you couldn't have got there without new life. But, he says, God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. No more death, sorrow, crying. He says, no more pain. Right? Those things won't even be a memory in new heaven, new earth, and new Jerusalem. Because if you remember pain, it's apt to bring you sorrow, but there's no more sorrow. If you remember the tears that you cried, it may bring pain. No more pain. I believe that the only tears that may be in new heaven, new earth, and new Jerusalem would be if God kept any of the ones that He bottled from old heaven and brought them to new heaven. Because the Bible does say that He bottles the tears of His saints. I don't know. But I know we'll never have to deal with it again. And notice when this transaction happens. It says that it happens after all of the judgments. As we receive our citizenship in new heaven, new earth, and new Jerusalem. Now I don't want to, I mean this is meant to be a happy lesson we're talking about new heaven, new earth, and new Jerusalem, but I will remind you at the great white throne of judgment, at the judgment seat of Christ, during the battle of Armageddon, throughout the millennial reign, when we see people that we've tried to be good stewards of Christ and instruct them in what thus saith the Lord, and we see them embrace a lie. Tears, pain, sorrow, death will still be around then. Right? Don't think that for one second, throughout any of the judgments, you'll escape the emotional ramifications for the acts that you did in your body after you got saved. Don't think for a second that those that die in sin will be able to stand before God without any regret or resentment or without any regret or envy for what they see that we've received. There's going to be pain and there's going to be sorrow. But notice when God takes these things away, it doesn't say that God does away with all tears. It says, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. Tears, plural. Right? Eyes, plural. There, meaning more than one person. I believe that God Himself is going to walk up to you and wipe away the tears that may have been left over from the great white throne of judgment. Or the tears that start to flow as you see new heaven, new earth, and new Jerusalem. God Himself is going to walk up to you and wipe them away and there will never be tears again. Right? Wouldn't it just be... We know that Jesus wept. Go read the book of John. Jesus was touched with the feeling of our infirmity. He was tempted in all points like we are, yet was He without sin. Christ, sitting at the right hand of the Father, is there as your great high priest, making intercession for you because He knows what you're going through. He's qualified to ask God for help on your behalf because He knows what you are and He knows what you're going through. I wonder, right? because we've already received our new bodies, we've become like Christ. You think that Christ... just because it's the great white throne of judgment or because it's the judgment seat of Christ, you think that Christ won't shed tears for those that He loved enough to die for? You've got a glorified body. Right? But how can we cry? Jesus cried. You're telling me you finally become like Christ and you're not going to cry anymore? But it says that God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. You know what wiping entails? A touch. You know what it takes to turn those tear ducts off once you get to new heaven, new earth, and new Jerusalem? 
a touch of the Creator to change you. This is the only change that I find after you receive your new body to where God changes something. And it's not because God did anything wrong. It's because He knows you'll have no more need of them. God made Adam and Eve with tear ducts because they need to blink. Okay, Eden may have been a perfect place, but there was still dust. Okay, He gave my eyelashes so that if things fell out of trees, it wouldn't get in their eyes. Okay, There's a purpose for tear ducts here nowadays. Where we're going, it's perfect. There's no more pain. You don't need to blink anymore. Your eyes don't dry out. Right? There's no more sorrow. There's no more tears of sorrow that will ever be shed. No more tears of pain or tears that well up due to your body's reaction to pain. You have no need of them anymore. So what's God do? Closes them off. But instead of just saying, all right, no more tears, no, He physically comes to you and says, you're not going to need these anymore. Wipes them away from your eyes. And it says, verse number 5, And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. He didn't say, I will make all things new. It says, I make all things new. Keep in mind, we've said this, God being omnipresent, that just doesn't mean every physical place at once, it means everywhere in time at once. It didn't say the one that will sit on the throne that day. He's always been the one that sits on the throne. And God's telling John in this verse, right, there's coming a day that all of this will be revealed. He's showing him the future, but I believe in this passage, he's talking in the present. It didn't say that Jesus was going to eventually one day prepare a place for you. No. He said, if I go to prepare a place for you. Where was he going? He was going to prepare it then. What's he doing to this day? Still preparing it. By the time we get to this day, New Jerusalem's already finished. He's already made it. It comes down out of heaven. Right? He's showing him the things in the future, but he tells him right now, he says, behold, I make all things new. Right now, John, I'm working on the city that you're seeing fulfilled through prophecy, through divine revelation right now. He says, it's not finished. It doesn't look like that yet. But behold, right now, I make all things new. Then, to double down on it, he said, right, for these words are true and faithful. He's reminding him here in this verse that he promised that if he went away, he'd be preparing a place for him. He said, it's faithful and true. I make all things new right now. Talking about new heaven, new earth, new Jerusalem. But he's also talking about present tense when it comes to salvation. He says, if somebody wants to get in, I still make all things new. The door's not closed. I'm still making new creatures. I'm still involved in the business of taking that which was the off scour of the world and turning it into a child of God. He says it in the present tense because God will always make things new. He makes all things new. Doesn't matter what it is in your life, He can make it new. Doesn't matter where it came from, doesn't matter how messed up it is, He can make all things new. Doesn't matter if what you desire doesn't exist in your life, He made everything out of nothing. He can make all things new. Right, and He says, and these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, It is done. On that day, new, the creation of new, he's saying, is finished. He'll never have to create another new thing again unless he desires it in his will. When he says it is done, he's talking about the plan that was laid before the foundation of the world. He says, The lamb that was without spot, without blemish, slain before the foundation of the world, has finally fulfilled and everything has come to fruition according to God's plan. He says the plan is done. He's not talking about time because time goes on for eternity. He's not talking about 
the city of New Jerusalem. It may be finished, but it's not done. It's not over. Done means completed. Done means that something that was in work has finally been worked to perfection. That's why when teachers used to tell me, I'd say, I'm done. They'd say, no, you're finished. And I'm like, nope, I'm done. It's in the Bible. God said, it is done. I am done. Most of them were heathens, and they didn't take that as a valid excuse. It says, it is done. I'm Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. And you know that Alpha is the first letter in the Greek alphabet. Omega is the last letter of the Greek alphabet. But Alpha also means supreme. Okay, Alpha, by definition, who runs the wolf pack? The Alpha of the wolf pack. Okay, an apex predator. Okay, there can be multiple apex predators in an ecosystem, but there's only one that rules everything. That's the Alpha. Okay, the Alpha is the one that everybody else listens to. Omega, when it comes to the end, it's not just saying that he's the beginning and the end of time, right? He's the first, but he's also the end. If he wasn't the end of all things, right, he wouldn't be self existent. He wouldn't be God. You can't just be God by being the beginning, you also have to be the end. But if he wasn't Omega, he wouldn't be able to say what he said just before this. It is done. In order to complete something, you have to be able to finish. God's saying, I'm the Alpha and the Omega of this plan. Where was the plan of salvation formed? In the heart of God. Where? The beginning. Where does this plan come to fruition? At the Omega of the plan, the end. Why did the plan become successful because God started it and God finished it why is new heaven new earth and new Jerusalem going to last for all of eternity because God started it and then God finished it he's the beginning and the end of all things okay but he says I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely but didn't he just say in verse number 4, that he'd wipe away all tears. There'd be no pain, no more sorrow. We've got a body like Christ. We won't get thirsty in heaven. But if you decide to eat, I believe you're not going to get fat either. Hallelujah. If God says, hey, come down and have a bite with me, it's not because God is hungry. It's because God wants to have a time of fellowship with you. Right, it's because he wants you to share in the experience of whatever was prepared. Doesn't the master call come and dine? Come and partake of what it is that was prepared? So why is he saying, talking about new heaven, new earth, new Jerusalem, he tells John, hey, write, for these words are faithful and true. And then he said unto it's done. I'm Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give. That's future tense. But from that day forward, no one's going to need a taste of the waters of the fountain of life. What's he saying? Again, he's talking about future things. And then he comes and talks to John where John's at, which is on the Isle of Patmos. Right? He's just been called up to the third heaven. And he says, John, just, just a reminder, let everybody know. If they want to become a partaker of that day, I'll make them a partaker now by giving them a drink if they're thirsty. Because on that day, no more thirst. On that day, no need for a taste of something to make you alive because you're already alive. But I also wonder if in all of eternity future, Right, Jesus says, hey, I know that when you got a drink of it the first time using flesh, he says, you really want to understand how sweet a taste of salvation was? And he may just give you a cup of water from the fountain of life. I don't know. But he's also promising 
anybody that hears what he's gone to prepare. He says, if you want a drink, whenever you read this, I can still give you a drink. He says, I still will give a drink. Even though that city, you've seen it, it's finished. He says, there's still room for more. Well, it goes on, verse number 7. He says, He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. Well, the end of verse number 6, talking about the lost that receive salvation, right, that's what, a, giving a cup of water from the fountain of life, isn't that what he told the woman over there in John chapter number 4, the woman at the well? Right, if any man drink of the water that I give him, he's never thirst again. Right? Well, who's he giving it to in verse number 6? The thirsty, the lost. He's talking about those during the grace age, the dispensation of grace. Then, verse number 7, he's talking about those under the dispensation of the great tribulation. You don't have to overcome to receive salvation today. Jesus overcame to give you salvation. The only thing you have to overcome is your own pride to submit yourself and admit that you were a sinner, repent of it, and then ask Jesus to save you. But verse number 7 is talking about those that have to go through the great tribulation. He says, To him that overcometh, overcomes the, the Antichrist, the prophet, the dragon, overcomes the mark of the beast, overcomes the social pressure, the political pressure, that forsakes all and then runs off into the wilderness to seek God because they know that God's the only one that has any hope for them. He says, to those that overcome during the great tribulation, they shall inherit all things. You know what they get? The same thing that people from verse number 6 get. All things. It says, and I will be his God and he shall be my son. So verse number 6 and verse number 7, what's he talking about? Any point from when John received this revelation until the events of the millennial reign end, he says, if anybody wants to get into the family of God, they can get in. You know what I see in verse number 6 and verse number 7? Whosoever. You know what I see? That God so loved the world in perpetual tense. He says, anybody that draws their first breath from the time that John wrote the book of Revelation down until the end of all things, if they either come in by grace through salvation, through faith, or whether they come through the dispensation of tribulation or temptation at the end of the millennial reign, he says, if they overcome during that period, and they resist and they fight to prove their faith in God. He says, all of them are going to get the same thing. He's saying, I haven't excluded anybody. And you say, why would he write that? How many times does the Bible say this? Well, he wrote it because people are dumb. And some people would have read the verse right before this, in verse number 6, where he says, it is done that means that Jesus has already prepared everything that he's going to prepare and there's no hope for people that are coming in the future. Jesus says hogwash. Just to remind you, anybody that wants a drink of the fountain that I told the woman at the well about, they can still get a drink. He says even after that fountain is closed up, right, because God has removed the Holy Ghost and now it's the time of tribulation. He says those that want to get in, they can still get in. He says, you're seeing the finished product, but it's not done yet. He's saying there's still room for all that want a place. Well, then verse number 8. It says, but the fearful, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, and whoremongers, and sorcerers, and idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Well, didn't he say in verse number 4 that there was no more death? Here he's reminding you that the reason there's no more death in new heaven, new earth, and new Jerusalem is because the second death has already happened. 
but it's also a warning to those that aren't partakers of received a cup of the fountain of life that they need to check themselves it says all liars that, that lumps everybody up right there you say brother Jordan I've lied before in my life does that mean I'm going to the lake of fire no because if you've been, been saved right, if the blood was applied in the eyes of God you're not a liar no more when you get a mortgage or when you get a car loan, when you pay it off, you're not a debtor anymore. You're an owner. Nobody else has claim to it anymore. It's yours outright. In fact, they redo the title of the vehicle and take the other person off of it, showing that they have no right to it. When the blood was applied to your life, you're no longer a liar. You're no longer any of the things in this verse. In the eyes of God, it was as if it never happened. When you pay off your house, nobody cares that somebody gave the money up front. Now you own the house. Nobody can put a lien on it anymore. Nobody can foreclose upon it. Right? It's yours. The bank's happy. They got their interest. They don't care. Right? Death was satisfied with the blood of Christ. It doesn't care how it got paid. It just got paid. And when that blood was applied to your life, you're no longer any of these things. You may still have to wrestle with this flesh, which isn't saved, but your soul isn't a liar no more. It isn't an idolater. It isn't a whoremonger or any of the other things. What this verse is a reminder, of, if you were to study it all out, we don't have time. Okay, but fear, unbelief, Okay, abominations, murder, whoremongers, okay, sorcerers, idolaters, liars. Each one of those things attacks a specific point of God's holiness. Yes, we know that all these things are brought about by sin, but sin causes people to disgrace the holiness and the righteousness of God every day. That's why they're the enemy of God, whether they know it or not. And if you were to study out what each one of these things literally represents, but then also figuratively represents, it shows a different way that people reject God each and every day in their lives. We'll go back to verse number 7. To them that overcome all of these things, all of these natural desires in the flesh. To those in verse number 6 who received a drink of water because they realized they had a thirst that nothing in the earth could satisfy that new creature doesn't have these desires any longer. Why? Because we became one with God. We were accepted in the beloved. We were made the child of God. We were apart instead of being outside. All the people on the outside, what do they do? They attack the holiness of God. They embrace the idea of pride in the flesh. And that is what will lead to their destruction. It's the pride of not being able to admit that they are wrong. It's the unbelief in what Christ has already done. But he says they shall have no part of what he has, but they shall have their part in the lake of fire and brimstone. That phrase, that they shall have their part, just as God has gone, to prepare a specific place, a part of new heaven, new earth, new Jerusalem, specifically for each and every believer, there will be a place for all of eternity in the second death, the lake of fire and brimstone, where there will be a place specifically reserved for each person that rejects God. They'll have a portion of it with their name on it. And God's saying, I didn't make that part for them. They made that part for themselves. He said, all the parts of new heaven, new Jerusalem, new earth. He said, I made all of those specifically for you out of love. He said, but your part in the lake of fire and brimstone, if you have one, was forged by yourself. You made your own nameplate and you nailed it to your own spot in the lake of fire. 
And he said, because I've been above reproach in his distribution of the gospel. His plan is perfect. He says, everyone was without excuse. So if you have a part there, I didn't make that. You made that. And he says, but if you have a part in what I've made, I handmade that specifically for you out of love. Did you know that you could receive a daily devotion every morning in your inbox? Head on over to ibcflorence.com and click on Daily Devotions to sign up today. And as always, thanks for listening.